second. Okay. And and welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. To John Hopkins virtually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, we, yeah. <laughs> it's quite a new experience. I think that since since I start the academia life, I never been at home for so long. I think you too, right? <laughs> I think I'm you for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, Maybe we're all in that boat, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my my daughter start asking me why are you at home all the time. So get out of here. I I, I think <laughs> I am getting extremely lazy now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, yeah. you, hey, we don't have to dress up. We don't have to you know do anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes. Um, yeah, I think you start you start to merging the boundary between work and at home because when you go back to office and you go home, you sort of have the sense of ending something. But when yeah. you're at home, you kind of mixing the two together in some time. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm 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 going to mute myself now. Okay. Hey, thanks, uh, uh, Thomas, for uh, uh, recording. I have to. Steve, I cannot attend the full talk because I have another meeting going on. So yeah, I, will, I will be ducking out after some time. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank but, you. Thank but, you. Yeah, but yeah, thank you. But I'm, I'm very interested in all the stuff. I, by, by the way, I look at your LinkedIn postings. And <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. yeah, yeah. Very humbling. So thank you, Paul. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just sometimes using it to posting the paper. Right, right. So, and I, I, I will probably be discussing some things with you. Uh, okay. yeah, today we are meeting later, but you know, I'll also after that, I have to discuss, because you are also working in a, a domain that I'm interested in. I'm, I'm doing also a lot of work. So, you know, I think it's interesting. Yes, it does that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'll see you a little later. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and I see that um, well, more people have joined in the meantime. I think it's uh, uh, 12.01, so it seems like a good time to get started. So first, uh, let me welcome all of you to this um, graduate seminar of the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering at JHU. Today is a great, great pleasure to, um, to welcome and to hear from uh, Professor Steve Weiching soon. Uh, who we will introduce in a minute. Uh, but just before we do so, so I want to inform you this uh, seminar, this meeting is being recorded. And if you have any question, uh, please do not interrupt during the talk, but feel free to type them in the chat box and I'm sure we'll have a little bit of time at the end to have a discussion and go through those questions. And at the end, we can also directly, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask questions uh, during that discussion. Um, so that being said, I'll, I'll now hand it over to uh, Professor Shields to formally introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tomas. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Steve Sun, who's an associate professor at Columbia University. And uh, Steve and I have known each other for a few years through our Columbia connections, but also through some common interests specifically in machine learning and um, various methods in mechanics. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have uh, Professor Sun come and speak with us today. Uh, he's a really a, a prolific young professor in, in mechanics. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to belabor it, but uh, he's the, the recipient of many, many awards uh, in the field very early in his career. It's, it's a testament to the outstanding work that he's done. Some of those, the, some of those awards include uh, several early career awards, including the NSF Early Career, Air Force uh, Early Career, and U.S. Army Young Investigator Award, uh, the Leonardo da Vinci Award from the Engineering Mechanics Institute, and the Zinkevich Numerical Methods Engineering Prize. Uh, so without further ado, it, again, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Sun, and I will pass the, uh, the screen over to him to share with us the work that he's, some of the work that he's doing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Xu, for the very um, uh, kind uh, introduction. So, um, 
today I, I changed the topic a little bit uh, by uh, adding the last part, the levels are happening, and then uh, later on I'm going to um, I'm going to explain uh, what this is about. So um, the talk I'm going to present today is up, uh, mainly about polycrystal uh, modeling, uh, how to generate circuit for those uh, type of material, but it can also apply to other material systems. So let me. I know the right way to. Okay. So maybe I'll just put this way. Okay. So before I get into the details, I will first like to acknowledge um, my student, uh, Nicholas Rennes, uh, and my associate research scientist, Wang Ma. Uh, for contributing to this work. In particular, this work is mainly the products of uh, the collaboration between me and uh, Nicholas, who actually uh, specialize on geometric learning in our research group. So first, I want to give a very brief review about what is geometric learning and the implication of it on, on um, machine learning. So um, long story short, uh, geometric learning is the study of two different types of data that are not in the uh, classical uh, Euclidean space, the graph and metaphor. So in this talk, our focus would be mainly on the graph, um, but some of the techniques on the metaphor may, may be catch up in the later research. So graph theory is actually uh, starting from Euler. What actually necessary, uh, what is the necessary ingredient of the graph is that um, data are not represented in a Euclidean space, but they are represented as a nodes that are connected by edge. And sometimes those data set or those representations has advantages uh, in terms of represent the same informations. Um, you can see in that uh, at the beginning of the graph, uh, Euler tried to figure during the vacation, uh, what he trying to do is that he tried to visit all the bridges in the CD without repeating the without repeating the path he introduced, and he come up with a brilliant idea to name those conjunction with nodes, and then connect the path with the edge. And what what actually come up with is a specific technique to detect the path or the combination of the graph that allow him to travel. So fast forward to the recent year, the graph has found many important applications in language translations in predicting behavior in social network where individual users are actually uh, nodes connected by their friendships or relationships, um, uh, fake new detections, chemistry, in which case the atoms are connected to form molecule, molecule interact with each other can form at other level of the graph. And also uh, in a more, in a very classical sense, structural engineering where the where the join are considered as a nodes, and then the trust system or the bin system can be considered as a graph. Now for the mechanics problem that we consider here, we will consider a polycrystal also as a graph. And in each single grain of polycrystal, we will assign the nodes to it, and then the connectivity are actually connect with the edge. So this is one kind of information that we can store in a graph in, uh, um, instead of uh, storing it in a voxel. One key feature that we can get from this storage is that we have a very economical way to store the information. So here I will give a formal definition of the graph. A graph is a two triple, uh, basically a set of edge and the uh, vertex that are connect by each other. Okay, so in this case, if I have a uh, uh, a voxel image that are 1000 by 1000 by 1000. If I actually store it in the Euclidean space, I will meet, need 1 billion of voxel data. But if I store it in the graph, I would only need to represent the same set of the data uh, with, the, with two set of voxel and edge that are the, the number of uh, the nodes would be actually equal to the particle and then the edge would be equal to the connectivity. So I actually create something like a zip, zip uh, operation or compress of information just by re representing this as a graph. The same thing has been done in the problem mechanics early on um, where we try to study 
uh, the voice based geometry. So how does the geometry of the voice, not just the size affect the permeability? And this can actually allow us to converge the voice space into an underlying graph. And then from the graph, we can analyze the tortuosity or the voice ratios. Another application that we can see is from the DEM community or the granular mechanics community in which we analyze a false chain. If you think about what is a false chain, a false chain is actually the connection of the normal force among the grand particle. We can also consider this as an edge wage graph in which the, the weight of the edge is actually the force. There are many, many different types of graphs that have been used in mechanics um, and, uh, and actually they have become more and popular in recent years. Uh, another possibility of using the graph is actually from uh, University of uh, Michigan in which they try to connect the solution field uh, linking them by the deformation gradient as a, as a, a network of solutions. So uh, why are we concerned about the graph here? One thing that we want to study is the microstructure. So by actually studying the revolution of the graph, it gives us a very economical low dimensional way to describe the underlying mechanics without a huge amount of data. This is important because when we try to write a positivity model or we try to generate an ingredient of a model, we don't want to actually deal with a very high dimensional a set of internal variables. For example, you can imagine that in the positivity theory, we may easily incorporate the void ratio uh, as one of the key functions that affect the yield surface, but you don't want to actually put every work source in data uh, into the positivity model because the dimension is too high. So here, the graph opened up some possibility uh, to represent the no uh, dimensional uh, mechanics of the of the topology of the topology and the geometric revolutions. Now, the the important thing uh, I would actually like to consider one particular example. Now, imagine that uh, we have two particle, uh, we have two assemble, and then we actually measure all the uh, microscopic behavior. Uh, the grand size distribution, the void ratio, the average particle orientation, they all look identical, okay? But if you look at the microstructure, they're different. So uh, how do we actually distinguish A from B and C from D if all the measures, statistic measures are identical? So what it tells us is that we need a new parametric space or new descriptor that allow us to create a very piece, more precise descriptions and then incorporate those descriptions into the constitutive law in order for us to generate a mechanics model. So the first part of this talk is on the geometric learning, how to we actually create a low dimensional descriptor from the very high dimensional direct numerical simulations or micro CT observations such that we can generate a new generations of constituted law that can be put in into the constituted law with, uh, with to give us a more precise control without the burden of generating a very compact model. So the idea <clears throat> is the following. <clears throat> we will run um, we will run a lot of FFT simulations on different orientations. Uh, and with different microstructure. And then from the microstructure, we will try to regenerate the graph representations. And we try to use a technique called um, graph convolutional neural network to generate a low dimensional representation of the graph. So the graph is already a low dimensional representations of the uh, micro CD image, but we want to further uh, reducing the dimension of the graph so that we have a very handy or low dimensional uh, representations that uh, are about the graph. And then using this as an additional input, we want to change the constituted law according to the graph. So, and then we actually introduce something called a semi supervised learning in which the graph help us control the change of the shape of the energy functional in the strength space. And then uh, we want to actually uh, create a predictor where given a strength and a given graph, we can predict the energy. 
from the elastic store energy, we take the derivative of it. We can first derivative will give us the first critical stress, and then the second uh, derivative we give us the Hertzian, which is actually the tangential uh, operator. Okay, so in the first part, we will generate different microstructure and then we run the simulations. And then this is one uh, polycrystal simulation that are done with the FFT. Uh, the, rent, uh, the advantage of the FFT is that um, we can actually solve something uh, with a periodic boundary domain relatively quick compared to the final element. In, and it doesn't require us to create a, uh, to handcraft uh, very um, to the right match to simulate the model. So this is some of the results for the sake of time. I'm not going to give too much detail on this, but you can see some of the phase field and then the stress revolutions on it. Okay. Now with the enough data, what we want to do is to generate a low dimensional representation of the data. We will start with the number of grand, and then this is actually five grand that are connect to each other. And then the grand uh, in this particular example, uh, I would have a, a, a node set that have one, two, three, four, five corresponding to the grand here. And then the edge sets would be the edge that are connect to each other. For example, I have edge one, two, edge two, three, edge three, five, edge four, five, but I don't have edge one, four because they're not connected. So this creates a set. And what we actually have is that Instead of this abstract set, we can actually create a graph Laplacian that will present the topology connections. So we have a degree matrix that, that are actually have a number of the diagonal that indicate how much connections the particle have. So phi for particle three, for example, have phi neighborhood, and then we put the phi here that give us the sense of connectivity. And then we'll put the adjacency matrix there and then uh, and whenever there is a one that indicate that two, that two neighbor are connect together. So D minor A give us the graph Laplacian. Okay, the graph Laplacian can be, can gen, we can generate a symmetricized version of the graph Laplacian. And then this matrix is going to represent the topology of the grand connectivity. And then we can assign individual property on that uh, feature matrix or on another feature matrix. And then the feature matrix and the uh, uh, symmetric normalized graph Laplacian together are uh, represent uh, storing the information of the microstructure. So feature can be, is a column vector, uh, is actually a matrix and each column uh, contain one specific uh, feature. For example, the, in a, for crystal case, uh, how many phase does it have? in the polycrystal, what is the crystal orientation, what is the Young's modulus, the Euler angle, those things can be put as a weight in the graph. So here, for example, each, each nodes would have two weight. And also another thing is that the edge could also have weight. This weight can be put into a weight adjacency matrix. And uh, we are going to talk about that in the future work. But here, the focus is on the node weight graph. So uh, we will use a graph called convolutional neural network. And in particular, we will use the spectral type of graph uh, neural network in the sense that we would actually using the, um, the graph Laplacians and then the, the node feature vector to create an encode feature vector. So the encode feature vector is actually like the low dimensional representations of the, of the graph representations. And then, and then that, that um, architect is actually called semi-supervised learning. Uh, precisely what the graph did, uh, what the graph convolution the neural network did is actually like the uh, encoder part of the autoencoder. So uh, autoencoder is actually a specific type of neural network that when you give an input, it output the input exactly but the interesting thing about the uh, uh, autoencoder is that it will go through an uh, encoder process and a decoder process. And during the encoder process, the neuron of each layer will be reduced. When it reduces, it, when the number of neurons reduced from the input layer, where the input layer actually put out, uh, had contained the full information, it forced the neural network to find out the lower dimensional representations of the entire graph such that when we actually deal with the uh, decoder, when we actually apply it to the decoder, it generates the original image. 
So here the input is all the image, the, all the polycrystal image. We have more than one. And in that case, uh, uh, we tried uh, we tried different number, 100, 200 number of polycrystal uh, of uh, of polycrystal geometry that are converted into a graph, and then we create the lattice uh, dimensions that are that are actually used as an input as an encode feature vector. So in that case, the dimensions of the graph is further reduced. So without the graph, what we and other options that uh, have been done before is directly using the voxel image to generate a low dimensional image. But the difference between the two approaches is that using the graph, you can actually have an additional procedure so that it generates from a very high dimensional image to a low dimensional graph structure before we further reducing the dimensions. Another important thing to notice is that if we use the image as the input and then do the classical convolution to generate the feature vector, um, if the graph actually contains some noise or artificial ring artify, it will affect the encode feature vector. But if we deduct it into the, into the if we actually um, <coughs> compact the RVE in, in informations into a, into a ray graph, the ray graph will be identical with, the, with even with a ring artifier and other type of noise. So it will be more resilient. So the details of it is actually also featured here. So in some architecture, the, the graph also will introduce a pooling in which case it will identify the subgraph and then collect the subgraph into a NOx. And there are many, many different versions of the graph convolutions. And we just use one incident. There are actually more things that we can try, or we're going to try in the future. Uh, the key for generating the constituted law, we also find that it's important that uh, the model has smoothness. And in the classical way of uh, generating constitutive model, we will use the string as an input and then output the stress directly. And one of the problem is that the stress predictions are actually minimized against the L2 norm, which oftentimes is quite accurate according to the L2 norm measure, but the steepness C is going to be fluctuating. This is because the L2 norm basically gives no control on the gradient. So what we actually come up with is an approach where we are not changing the stress, we are not changing the, uh, we are not also not using the neural network to generate a backbox stiffness. We are going to change the energy functional, so that that will require a, a specific type of uh, neural network that can actually enable us to take two derivative. So you, if you try the neural network before you try the L, L E L U, you can actually seeing that if you take the second derivative, you often get zero. This is actually because the basis of it is actually not uh, having the, the C, C2 continu continuity that allow you to take the derivative. So, but here, what we actually did is that we first set up a different type of loose functions that allow us to not only minimize the discrepancy between the train energy functional and the benchmark energy functional, but also the derivative. So we control the data. So, it also gives us another advantage because as we actually train the model in each uh, material point, in each data point, we can not only take advantage of the data point itself, but also the gradient and then the, and the curvature to help us creating more information to train the neural network better without more experimental tests. So this is the architecture that uh, we have tried uh, and then uh, and uh, as a comparison, so an alternative of training the positivity model is basically using the recurrent neural network that introduced the idea of memory. So the recurrent neural network basically would take the current values, but it would also be using the previous step uh, to actually predict the new stress. And the, the other thing we can do uh, as a comparison is to train a fit, uh, multi-step feedforward neural network that include a multiple period step, or we can do the 1D uh, convolutional neural network. Okay, so this approach is going to compare to our Sobolev training approach in which we train again, not only the, not the L2 norm, but the Sobolev norm in the Sobolev space. So you can see here, this is actually uh, quite interesting is that um, in the classical way, we train the loss function using the mean, mean square earlier, we will get the pattern on the left. 
And then look at the, the values here, 10 to minus six to 10 to minus minus. If you train it with the H2 norm, uh, the interesting thing is that not only does the H2 norm is actually doing better, but also the even the L2 norm is actually doing better. So if you optimize again the L2 norm, if the, and then you measure how good it is using the L2 norm, the, the H2 norm training was actually perform better than the L2 norm, even if you measure against the L2 performance. So this actually tell you that the high order training is helping us getting accuracy, not only on the, not only on the energy itself, but also give us not only on the stress and stiffness, which is the first and second derivative itself, but even give us more accurate uh, energy. So this is some branch mark tax with the pressure dependent positivity. You can see in that the L2 norm and the H2 norm, even though the energy landscape look very similar with the control of the gradient and, uh, and, uh, Hertz and the second derivative, you can see in that the, the predictions are actually much more accurate. And this is important for final element that we, uh, implicit final element that require a tangent calculations. And we can also see in that how does different um, way, uh, how does different way that we put in affecting the, the resultant elasticity predictions. For example, if I just put the volume there, I would actually have the blue curve that I actually have quite a bit of Euler, 10 to minus two, 10 to minus one in the, uh, in the order, uh, yeah. But if I, as I increase more feature, I would actually moving that curve into the Left hand side, but at some point, if I add too many informations, the difference between very small. So that tell us that that give us the flexibility to introduce different uh, microstructure informations and then put it into the graph convolution to generate different type of low dimensional representations of the microstructure system. So this is some more results. You as you can see, the result generally looks good. But the interesting thing also is that we can also uh, ensure that the energy functional is convex. One of the difficulty of training the machine learning model is that it always often lack thermodynamic consistency. And by actually introduce a higher order um, uh, energy potential, we can actually connect the convexity of the energy functional in the strength space uh, to to the whether is actually from uh, the complexity of the energy functional to whether the en energy is an elliptic, which is important. Uh, another thing that uh, I would like to talk about is the implications on the <clears throat> on the training. How do we write the loss functions? Uh, in particular, the first and second gradient. Now, when we try to train the energy. When we try to train the when we try to train the model that generate the energy, the energy is a scalar, so that is not actually not a problem. But the first and second derivative are actually a second order tensor and a fourth order tensor. So uh, how we actually write those uh, tensor become also very important. The naive way to doing it is that we go to minimize the Euler component by component. But one way, one weakness of writing the loss function this way is that when you rotate the coordinate system, you may get a different error and you get a different learning rate. So your learning and then your resultant model are, are actually depend on the on the coordination system. One way to bypass this is actually to study the is actually using spectral decompositions to decompose a deformation gradient into the into the spin term. Uh, into the rotation term and into the principal stretch term. And for the rotation term, uh, we would actually, you, we actually need a specific measure to measure the Euler because rotation is in the special orthogonal group, which means that if you actually add two rotation together, it's not a rotation. But what we actually can do is that uh, we can actually find the correct measure to measure the difference by representing the rotation as an Euler angle, that would be one way. By actually checking how close they are, the two uh, rotation matrix to the identity and using the D algebra. And one thing we find that this is actually quite important in particular for crystal positivity is that when we have a crystal positivity model and when it yield, it usually activate a sleep system. And when an active, uh, when a sleep system is activated, 
uh, the plastic flow changed the direction very rapidly. You see here, the, so the component based uh, training, the major drawback is that when, the, when a discrete set of uh, plastic slip system getting activated, it cannot pick up the rep change properly. But with the Lie algebra, you can actually see that the, 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 the activations and the activation of the past uh, of the plastic slip lead to the plastic spin, a very quick plastic spin, those things can be captured uh, easily. So the next task we want to do is to, con is to extend the geometric learning for uh, machine learning scheme to the plasticity. So um, basically we have two tasks to doing that. One is that uh, we would actually generate a lot of uh, either so positivity data or, or stress strain curve and then use the recurrent neural network uh, to actually generate a constant law. <clears throat> so the problem of this approach is that it will generate a model that are actually um, become a back box that are really hard to analyze. An alternative that we are trying to do in our research group is that we would use the elasticity energy functional we have from the previous training and then train what happened to the plastic part from giving the understanding we know the elastic revolutions. And it is done in the following. So this is an example on finding the initial uh, use surface. So we have we doing it for the material that doesn't uh, that are not pressure sensitive. So we only need to uh, investigate the possibility on the piping, and we start with the origins, and then we have different loading path that are start from the triangle, and then whenever the material the direct numerical uh, simulation start to yield. We actually put the pawn there and then we generate the initial use surface. And then we try some way to evolving the use surface using the machine learning. So if you know the positivity, we know that positivity is about ident yeah, at least the classical elastoplastic framework is about identifying the right initial use surface, identify the hardening law, and identify the plastic potential. In principle, you can curve fit any curve if you can find out what is the what is the plastic potential uh, or what is the plastic flow, what is the yield functions and how does the underlying elasticity, uh, plasticity and uh, hardening actually evolve together. So the goal actually here is to actually consider how do we actually create a multi-step training that train the elasticity and then change the plasticity. So in the initial yielding point, you can we can rotate the the REE, and then we can actually easily create different initial use service by linking it together. Okay, so this can be done in machine learning by generating uh, initial yielding, uh, yielding point. And then we can see in that how does rotating the individual particle actually lead to a uh, different use service on the piping. Um, but the, uh, for the rest of the presentations, this would be a very high dimensional problem. So we will first elucidate that problem with our isotropic, well, assuming isotropic, which is not the case in real life. In reality, you can see that when I rotate the angle, the use of it changed quite a bit for uh, given REE, right? Uh, but for simplicity, I will just consider an isotropic response. And we try to study how does the isotropic response lead to the change of the yield functions and how does the yield function and the plastic flow lead to the plastic deformations. So again, we will do the same thing. We have FFT simulation. However, in this time, we already know what is the underlying elasticity. And then we try to find out the initial yield point, and then we use the elastic model to actually tell us what is, your, what is the distance between the try stress and the correction stress. And then from that, we can actually get the plastic flow. Uh, so this idea kind of like, uh, um, I mean, I have a six year old daughter at home, so it kind of, generate kind of uh, inspired by this idea. If in the individual uh, piping, I actually load a plastic loading, I can actually link those things together if I can assume a certain basis that are sufficiently smooth. In fact, this has been done in the history of plasticity. You can think about, um, you can create a geometrical interpretations of the plasticity by thinking about the development of the plasticity model as the inventions of new shape in the in the in the stress space, particular for isotropic plasticity, where you only 
where the, the plasticity response is only depends on the principal values of the stress. So different U surface here, you can think about it as basically by creating a new U, U surface, you actually create a new shape in the principal stress space. So now what we actually want to do is to use machine learning to generate new shape and then we cast the positivity model as a problem where we want to actually use the, the data we obtain from experiment or, or DNS simulations to control how does these uh, use surface shape are actually evolve under not uh, for a different uh, uh, for uh, due to the change of the internal variable. So it, it changed it project a very abstract problem into a geometric problem and you can actually uh, again the advantage is that uh, if you study positivity you probably know that you can actually again link the complexity uh, with the thermodynamic consistency and then the, and then all the non-convex material with some kind of phase transitions. One thing that we actually did and I found that is quite useful is that um, we would convert the U surface not using the original shape, but we will convert it into some different functions. So remember that in the original testing data, we would load the experiment or load the DRN until we observe the initial yielding point. And then I would draw a circle on that yielding point, right? Okay, but then I actually don't know anything inside and outside if I actually just linking those points together with an implicit functions, and hence I cannot compute the stress gradient, which is actually required to compute the plastic model. So what we come up with is that since we know the internal has to be the elastic domain, the external has to be the, uh, the impossible domain, and then the past plasticity is light on the U surface, we can convert it, the, the U function, any arbitrary U function into a scientific functions. A scientific function is actually a specific type of implicit function where the gradient of the of the of the um, scientific function is actually equals the norm of it is always equal to one. So this is actually, for example, the warmisters, the Tresker that have uh, undergoing kinematic uh, um, hardening, uh, and all this, uh, and then this is actually coming from the RVE model or the non-convex model. What we actually find is that. We can solve the we something called a uh, initialization in the level set theory to obtain those sign distance functions, and then for each incremental time, uh, this is actually what I want to show here. For each incremental time, we can actually observe how does the U surface changing by actually consider uh, by actually consider the the new data that we generate from experiment. But um, the only thing that we need to do is that in the initial uh, Hamilton Jacobi governing equations, we are evolving the U surface in an artificial time. But here, the artificial time domain is represented by the scalar internal variable. So, we actually, what we need to do is that we actually conduct multiple experiments in different stress paths, have a different initial yielding point. And then we observe if you further loading it, how much. Of the of the internal variable evolve, and then we actually create another ISO contour for a given inter, uh, scalar internal variable, and then that will give us uh, a time matching uh, level set that we can actually uh, solve from an inverse problem to obtain the speed functions that give us the governing equations of the Hamilton Jacobi equations. So once we have the new solutions, we actually solve the initialization problem then we would actually generate a set of solutions of that Hamilton Jacobi equations. And the rest is just to use the level set to train it. The training is actually go through the, is actually pretty much the same, except that the FI is actually trained when uh, for, uh, for the same given um, internal variable. So there are multiple use surface. Um, the initial U surface and then the U surface at the at the at a different given uh, internal variable, and then what we're trying to do is to actually uh, changing it with a super simple supervised machine learning, and then we can actually generate the resolutions not just a in not just a single U surface, but how does the U surface evolve over the change of the internal variable? So. Um, 
this is one example of the level set uh, that are actually chain from uh, uh, RVD of polycrystal. Uh, as you see, it start out as um, as a simply look like a Trasker model. As it actually create more, as we loading it more, it actually generates something. I find it quite interesting in the sense that it actually changed the shape. The hardening is not isotropic because it's not just enlarging the Trasker model, but it actually generating the it actually changed the shape as we're actually yielding it. And this is something I find it quite amazing because if you try to handcraft a positivity model, if you are, uh, you are actually a past positivity model, you probably know there are many many type of hardening. But then it, essentially, what you what is commonly used is uh, isotropic hardening that actually uh, making the the um, the yield function become bigger or smaller. The kinematic hardening, which actually can be considered as a rigid body uh, movement in the principal stress space, or rotation hardening, in which you rotate the Tresca U surface with the rigid body rotations in the principal stress space. But we found out that in the level set uh, model, not only can we recover all those classical um, classical revolutions, we can also discover new hardening mechanism that have never been discovered before, but actually are very important for us to, to actually make a very predict, uh, predictive simulation. So here, imagine that uh, we don't have machine learning and we try to handcraft the hardening from the trash car into this shape, it would be very difficult. Okay, if not impossible. For example, I cannot think about how can I act, even if I know the answer, I would be have a hard time to find out what is the speed functions that are actually give us the give us the revolution? But with the machine learning, we can come up with a with a implicit function that are really hard to imagine and yet are actually usable. And, and another thing that are very important is that in general, this thing uh, these levels of hardening can actually generalize the majority of the hardening and the use of this mechanism because instead of identify instead of using a classical way where we actually identify the use of it, we figure out the hardening, we do the positivity, we actually simply solving the opt finding the optimum way to actually generate the shape and the revolution that actually minimizing the discrepancy of the forward predictions. So this is one simulations. I just put one part of the piping. We can also do the same thing for the passive flow or actually put the passive flow as a constraint into the plastic, uh, into the stress gradient of the yield function, so that the two, so that uh, you don't have to use a non-associative flow rule. But this is just two underlying example. You can actually have a non-associative flow rule as well. And the nice thing about this is that the implementation doesn't change too far from the classical constitutive law. So I have a classical constitutive uh, return mapping algorithm. The only thing I change is the definitions of the yield functions uh, for a given internal variable and the tangent that are obtained from the automatic differentiation. So basically, um, the, we don't need any handcuff feature. And then once we finish the training, the material, the model is ready to go. So we can see some of the results. I think the result also show um, the ability of introduce some physical framework cover is a benefit of doing that compared to the back box model. So here, this is one numerical example we compare with the uh, recurrent neural network. <clears throat> what we're trying to do is that we will only give the computer um, the monotonic loading. And then we actually, but in the predictions, we try to ask the computer of the neural network, the recurrent neural network, and now model to model the cycle loading. So because the RNN never see the loading before, what it predict is something like this, it moving up. And then when we do the unloading, instead of predicting the elastic unloading, it will go here. <clears throat> and you can see, start to see the oscillation because the training pattern level have the unloading. But with the elastoplastic framework, the result is not perfect, but at least it generates something that still makes sense. Because we in this uh, approach, we retain the physics uh, we retain the theory of the elastoplastic framework. We just replace the most tedious part uh, uh, of generating the hardening handcraft, uh, hardening and the use surface uh, 
approach. And this is more training. As you can see, if I actually in, extend the database, the recurrent neural network, uh, the multi-step uh, feed-forward network, um, the gay recurrent, and then the convolutional 1D network all sh show some improvement. But as you can see, if we compare with the level set hardening, the level set hardening can produce a more robust, if not more accurate results. So you can see here, and the more importantly, it gives us some answer on the thermodynamic. You can see in that as the yield function is evolving, it remains convex. And then, and then we can actually completely, we can actually generate the right explanations on where is the plasticity going. You can see in that loading it in this part, or loading it in this direction lead the, leading the U surface to be actually converged from the Chaska shake to the new shake that, uh, that I don't think there is any, any name for it yet. So, and also because of the smoothness that are guaranteed by the Sobolov chaining uh, on the new network, we can also put it into an implicit parallel element. So in the old days, uh, uh, the, our, one of the major difficulty is that after we change the stress, we need to somehow compute a tangent, but because the stress is uh, oscillating, for example, something like this, when you compute a tangent, it's actually oscillating, so it makes the Newton Watson's uh, software actually suffer a lot. Okay, but here with the uh, with the subalert training, we also get a very smooth uh, algorithm uh, that are actually uh, able to give us the plastic simulation without any difficulty. So this is actually the growth of the plasticity in the real time at a given material point. We also compare the results in different material point and then see the forward prediction result. And when we compare with the full FFT simulations of the bar, and you can see that uh, it's not perfect, but then this is a fine predictions. And then we uh, we actually uh, get a very uh, very uh, close result, and then we can predict the the stress path on the piping, and then see how the revolutions of the plasticity are actually uh, going on. So I think I'm running out of time. So uh, thank you so much again for the invitation. So uh, we will continue to working on the connection of the graph. But also, we also try to create a model that are actually hopefully interpretable in the classical sense. So we can create a bridge be between the computational mechanics community and the machine learning community. And there are other approaches that we don't have time to talk about. For example, applying the game theory to verifying the model. Um, this could be found in the, our research group work page. Um, so uh, before I end this uh, talk, I want to acknowledge the, the funding source, uh, the Army Research um, Office, the Air Force, uh, NSF, Sandia, um, my former employer, my employee, employer as well, and the DOE, and uh, of course, the Columbia. So this is some of the, the publication that are related. You can find more information from my group web page. And again, thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank you for the invitations. Thank you very much, Professor Sun. Um, Thomas, how do we generally handle questions on here? I haven't uh, done this before. Well, uh, yeah, first let me thank you also, Professor Sun, for a really great presentation. Well, for question, it's uh, it's simple. I start by uh, looking at the chat box, but I, I don't see any here. So I'm happy to uh, open the floor if, uh, if that's okay with everybody. But if anyone has a question, you can just, uh, well, either type in the, in the chat box or unmute and ask it directly. So is there any question at that stage? Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. If no one is typing, all right. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Now, I might have missed it. At some point, uh, you end up with the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you said you're solving that using neural networks. Uh -huh. but, but do you have to do that? Hamilton Jacob is not trivial, but it's not. Why would you need the neural networks to solve the Hamilton Jacobi uh, uh -huh. uh, instead of just yep. numerically solving it? 
No, because oh, this is like actually great questions. If you if you solve the Hamilton Jacobi, okay, let's say you use a finite difference, it would be too slow. You, you need to solve a boundary value problem, then then that's pretty much okay. You can do it perfectly, but then it will be so slow that that you, you think about it. Okay, I have uh, let's say I have one million finite element, and then how many gases spawn do I have? Then I, each gas spawn I solve a Hamilton Jacobi. That would be game over. I see it's slow mainly down for the speed. So mainly for the speed, absolutely. So this is a very good question. Okay, okay, good. So the new compute computation is essential to save time more than anything else. So yeah. all right, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Any other question from the audience? Well, then if the audience doesn't have, I'll, I'll go one more. So okay. you go to, so if I understand something, so the so ball of training, because I have no idea about this. So ball of training means that you just add the, the stress predictions. Is that, is that all the, because that's the, the, yeah. the uh, derivative of the energy? Yeah, so the, so the classical training is that you try to minimizing the L2 norm. Okay, so and then in order to write a constitutive model, that L2 norm is actually applied on the stress. So you try to, to minimize the discrepancy between the predict stress and the benchmark stress. That would be the that would be the classical way to doing it. Okay, so the, the but the sublim chaining did is that uh, you you actually not only minimizing the distance between the stress. But also the distance uh, of the of the gradient of the stress in in which case oh, 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 that would be the that would be the the tangential uh, elastic plastic operator right oh, but sorry, oh, elastic but that would be the el uh, elastic tangential operator okay then I have I have two small questions based on that one would be okay one is just very formal does it is it the training like, is it so ball if it's just the norm that you use, or do these approximations actually satisfy? No, not just the, the, there are two things that you need to do. One, you need to have the right norm because the norm gives you the criteria and then it affects the learning rate, but also the activation functions. Remember that your, your solutions, you can only produce the solutions from the using the activation function as a basis. So if right. your basis is actually like this, then no matter what norm you do, you cannot finish the training. So okay, we, have a, <clears throat> we have a, also have a customized uh, activation functions that uh, actually that actually guarantee the continuity. This is actually very important. Also, you don't want so so this is the um, this is one of the the important part is that uh, if you choose the wrong activation, not wrong, but the your when you design the loss function, it's very important to think about what is the image of the activation functions. But then in, in this case, it's just a continuity. But if you if your base doesn't have that feature, then it then it would never happen. You, you know what I'm saying, right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I got that part. Oh, All yeah. right, this is my last question, I promise. Okay. Uh, okay. okay, sure. Uh, yeah. Since you go to the and you go to the derivatives and you do the you know the the, the strain energy function and everything, could you could you predict localization? Could somebody say Okay, let me now go and uh, you mean the type, type of loss of elliptic type and, uh, and and do that prediction? Have, have they done that? Can you can you predict that? Uh, well, I mean, um, can you predict that? I think it's possible. I mean, because you have to see because you have the tangential operator, so you have you can actually find out you can compute the acoustic tensor and then check whether the acoustic tensor is singular. I never tried that, but this is an interesting thought. I never, this is possible. So, but what also, um, the what is another important point is that um, when you use the more Coulomb or Traska, you have that sharp corner, right? The, well, okay. yeah, but you don't need the corner. I think that would be a great yeah. way of your results is that you don't really exactly. need the corner. Exactly, right. this is also another trick because now, normally in a classical positivity literature, you write specific, you write a new paper just to actually resolve that corner, recognizing it. But the machine learning create, create a genetic way to actually create, replacing the sharp corner into a very sharp gradient. 
or if you don't like, you can actually also use the activation to make it very smooth. Or, but I don't know whether I would recommend that. But so this is also the flexibility that I provide from the machine learning. Thank you again. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Steve, I have a question. It's Mike Shields. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So at the toward the end, you started talking about um, you know the unloading scenarios and being yeah. able to replicate things like hysteresis. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't catch all of the details there, uh -huh. but in, you know in the in the measures that you were showing, you were showing some some scalar measure of of stress and strain in a yeah. hysteresis loop. Yeah. To what extent can you extend this to things that are perhaps highly path dependent? You know, where you're kind of snaking through the, um, the triaxiality space. Uh, I think that, I mean, you kind of pay the price for the complexity. So, I mean, first of all, I just show one, uh, I just pick one uh, component in the string and one component for the stress, but the prediction is in completely 3D. So it's a, it actually is a 3D uh, stress string. Uh, it's actually a complete 3D model prediction. So, mm -hmm. it, so that is part of it. Uh, that is so we are not trying to individually uh, do a unilateral test. This is a when this is an arbitrary string uh, path to arbitrary string. Okay. But but um, but the but the, but the interesting thing I, I think is that the, the the more channel you have, you you can see you need more pay more data just by look thinking about the level set. If the machine, so here we make the assumption just to make the training uh, complete faster. We want to get the paper out perhaps. Is we, we are assuming that the pairs is not pressure sensitive, which actually reduce the 3D problem into 2D because if it's not sure. pressure sensitive, I project in the five frame. But as I actually want to generate something more complex then the level set problem become more complicated. You can say, think about it. If I want to write a general, uh, Positivity model that are isotropic. I need to deal with sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. The piping is no longer good enough, or I have to consider the at least if I use the piping, I have to consider the hydrostatic axis. Okay, mm -hmm. but if I want to generate uh, like what you're, you're talking about, if I want to generate even more generalized model, like um, like uh, if I want to generate an isotropic uh, uh, also positivity model, I have to consider the six uh, at least six different dimensions because all the components now can I cannot use the invariance to write the possibility model. Um, so so yeah, I think it today's a price, but the, the nice thing about that the level set approach is that um, you can kind of see how you need to create a shape. For example, if I want to write a cam crane model, I want to generate a shape that looks like, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit like a volleyball or something like that. How many points do I need to actually Generate a shape. You you have a you you have a geometric idea on how how to explore the data and how to generate a shape. But uh, I admit that this is a guessing game because you have to know some smoothness. What if there's a dark corner that in some corner you have some funny shape? Then it's really hard to tell. So that right. would be related to the exploration problem. Maybe using some active learning or or explorations, but. But, but the, I guess the interesting thing is that it's kind of like exploring, creating the map when you don't know, when you never visit that place before. You, you, you can, so you can think about the, the, the experimental test as a hiking trip, and then we go through the mountain or visiting some path, and each path gives us a clear idea of how to draw the contour to create a map. So, so that would be the, so underlying it, the idea is basically coming from maybe inspired by hiking uh, subconsciously, but you kind of get the idea that in the geometric uh, pro problem, if by projecting to the Hamilton-Jacobi problem, what we want to do is to control the revolutions and know the revolution and know the shape. But I think knowing the shape is more intuitive than knowing the stress strain curve <laughs> because you can, yeah. So uh, sorry for the long answer. So I hope I answer your question somehow. No, you did absolutely, and I actually, if I if I have the uh, the liberty to to follow up on that, um, so you mentioned that okay, so if you want to if you want to fully flush it out and, and build it up so that you can you can include sort of all path all possible paths through the through the space, it requires a lot of training, right? You have you'd have to run 
uh, various various uh, scenarios that are probably the most important scenarios. And so the question is, is there something inbuilt into your model that you could use as a as a metric for learning? And what I mean by that uh -huh. is when you explore a region of the stress space that you haven't previously visited with your training set, is yeah. there something in your model that could tell me, hey, wait a minute, I need to come out of the 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 yeah, yeah. the more the exploration. model that you have and I need to actually run the high fidelity simulation at this location and uh -huh. then I can retrain and, and revisit the that yeah, uh, area. I mean th this is a great idea and I've thought about that but uh, yeah I, I think that this is actually uh, the possibility like if you have different fidelity model and you need to get different refinement or actually different level of confidence in that detail in, into generating a shape. Yeah, I think this is possible. I haven't tried it. Um, yeah, for example, you can think about it. Maybe in some data exploration, I may want to use uh, this location dynamics or something like that uh, instead of the uh, crystal positivity simulation. So I think those are possible. I haven't get the chance to to find a way to, um, to exploring it. Um, I do, however, think about it as a discrete problem where we generate a decision tree and then try to explore the decision tree. But that would be that would be different than the, the exploration problem for the level set because decision tree is live in a discrete space. So you have to predefine your decision tree. But in the continuous space, you probably Maybe it's possible. Maybe maybe when you can actually generate the decision tree on the fly instead of choosing the, the branch on the decision tree. Yeah, but I think there's a lot we can talk about. So yeah, we we have time to talk. I'm meeting with you right after this. So we can Okay, yeah. We can continue this then. Okay. Yeah. Great discussions. Great discussions. Are there any uh, more questions from the audience, from the students? Well, if not at this time, I think uh, we may we may close the session. Then uh, we will uh, first once. Oh, uh, yes, no, that was a chat, but just saying thanks. Uh, so first, many thanks again from all us from the department for for this for this great talk. Uh, really appreciate. And so uh, now, uh, Steve, you'll have a few uh, meetings with faculty. So uh, stay, stay with us, just have a, a 15 minute break and then you're meeting with uh, Professor Shields. Uh, so thank you all uh, for attending. Thank you, thank and, you Thomas for hosting me. Thank you. Of course, our pleasure. Thank you, goodbye. Uh, Thomas, yes? quick question. Will I, uh, will I meet with, with Steve on this channel or should I send him a link to my channel? How should we do that? It's another channel, but you should both have the link in your calendar. Ah, you sent, okay, you sent the link in my calendar. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so enjoy the, the right. meeting. Bye. I'll talk to, Steve, I'll talk to you in a few minutes. Yeah, okay, thank you.